Welcome everyone. Just making sure that we're all together. Um, very kind and good that people can can come and make time for this and hopefully you'll find it's a useful meeting. Um, it's always very odd talking on webinars because we never quite know who's who's there but we can see that there are people starting to join so that's very good news. Um, I'm Jason Warren. I'm never quite sure. I think a lot of you have met me before, kind of come across me in different uh, contexts, either in the clinic or in the um, support group, in this support group or in the remote support groups now. And I'm uh, one of the neurologists at the Dementia uh, Research Centre who's um, taken a particular interest in um, PPA and um, in particular helped Chris Hardy to run the um, meeting uh, remote meetings uh, currently uh, along with uh, Nikki Zimmerman and the rest of the team um, and um, we try to make these meetings as useful as possible for everyone um, the things today we've got lined up it's, it's looking like quite a, a good lineup hopefully so many of you will know Anna uh, Falkmer um, she is our very specialist speech and language therapist who has um, both a clinical and an academic interest in PPA talking today to us all about uh, practical tips um, which will be very soon after I go away um, and then um, after Anna we've got um, probably I think at about quarter past ten hopefully um, very kindly a member um, someone living with um, uh, progressive non-fluid aphasia. Um, uh, Martin Cooper very kindly has agreed to speak to us um, and I think he's got some things going on on the home front so hopefully they will hold together and allow him to do that but it's very very kind he's very, very welcome. Um, and then normally what we try and do at these meetings is give you everybody a, a bit of an update on where we are with research and particularly um, now in this day and age of course with COVID where we, no one's quite sure what anyone's doing and whether there's any research we thought it might be quite important to reassure everybody that there is still research going on and so what I've asked very kindly is if the two of the people who actually do most of the work in the research line who are currently um, PhD students in my group at the Dementia Research Centre that's Jess Jiang and Mike Carmen and Makrina Kimuro who I think many of you well, some of you will have met during research either face to face or possibly remotely um, just to give us a bit of an update um, at sort of around uh, 10 30 um, so they, they will run through what we've actually been able to do which is remarkable and um, it is a remarkable effort from the team from, from those two in particular but from Chris and the rest of the research team um, that that you know as much as been possible for transfer remotely as has been possible so they're interested to hear how they summarize all of that for us and then hopefully we're running to time at about quarter to 11 we should have 45 minutes or so a q and a which Anna Falkner will chair but there's a panel of, of uh, people who will introduce but it it'll, it'll be um, Anna of course Nikki um, who is the the lead currently um, coordinating RDS for the PPA support group, um, rare dementia support, and um, Jess and my Carmen will join as well as we hope Martin, of course. So for that panel discussion, so um, we're asking people to send in um, uh, questions um, via chat, I think, um, or messaging, which will get. Um, the team behind the scenes to coordinate and then present to the panelists and hopefully that way we'll get most of the questions addressed but always it seems there's more questions than we can address in real time and so don't worry um, it's perfectly um, okay to send questions in sort of later or if you feel that you weren't sure if it got sent in or we'll go through and collate the ones we don't have a chance to discuss and then um, either get back to people um, separately or possibly do another uh, debriefing uh, session depending a little bit on how many questions come in and that's all fine we can be flexible um, about that um, so I, hopefully um, between the you know those different things we'll manage to address most of the um, questions so um, I just wanted to say before I hand over to Anna the, the 
I mean, this is really a team effort. I mean, it really is a team effort, and particularly getting remote meetings going um, is is great. Um, Nikki, always for kind of tireless organisation and oversight of things. Um, um, Alicia uh, Willoughby, the particularly um, uh, involved in um, newsletter, which many of you will have seen, and setting up the meeting, getting a lot of the technical things um, together and recordings. Um, managing to hopefully get me in line, um, um, but then others, many people who you would have had contact with, Claire, Livy, Catherine, for, for organising various aspects of the meeting, and it is a team effort. Um, we, we've, we've got um, Chris, Chris Hardy, who many of you will know, um, who's done both work on this meeting, but also in the research side. And I just wanted to say, as a, as a bit of a plug, if that's okay, that um, the there is still, as we'll hear, quite a lot of research going on. Um, and in particular, the work, the survey on staging of PPA um, that Chris has been leading on is ongoing. Um, and many of you have helped with that, which we're very grateful. We are starting to try to pull that information together. It's possible we'll come back to you more than once in different ways about that um, to try and pull it all um, together. There's um, a new study going about masks use, um, PPE mask use and COVID, um, which um, Chris and uh, Anna and others have been very much involved with. And we'd be really grateful for people to um, come back on that if possible and tell us there's a series of questions about your experience of, of using masks and, and in other related aspects of, round, of communication around COVID. Um, very, very keen to get your thoughts about that. I mean, PPA, I think, has a vital part to play in highlighting some of the difficulties that people living with dementia more generally, even much more common forms of dementia have. Um, so I think really, really keen, if you if you do get that, uh, have time to do that survey, it, to go through that and be very, very keen to hear your thoughts about it. Um, we've got um, quite a lot of expansion going on behind the scenes. So um, the direct support teams uh, expanding, hopefully particularly to help with regional um, um, support. There's a new online forum being developed for members of the PPA support group to discuss issues and uh, you know different aspects of living with the illness. Um, that we hope will be ready soon. Um, there's um, further announcement I think to be made about it at Rare Diseases Day, I think on the 28th of February. And we hope that it will go live after that and uh, what these within the next month or two. Um, and then that will be another resource. Be very interested to see what people's experience of that is. Um, the, there's the FTD annual, main annual seminar coming up. Um, James Rowe from, um, some of you will know from Cambridge, uh, is giving an overview of FTD at that meeting. And that's on the 10th of March. And many of you, I guess, may, may well want to attend that. Should be an excellent meeting as well. So there is quite a lot of activity going on despite the, the, the frustrations and hassles and sadnesses of COVID. Um, and we know, obviously, we're all living under pressure from COVID, but particularly, particularly people living with chronic diseases and particularly people living with dementia and PPA, um, with various things, some of which we can foresee, some of which we probably can't, around lockdown, various things. So do please, I mean, the, one of the really important messages is do please seek help and support, even if it's just a chat or kind of knowing that other people are out there uh, from the direct support team. Uh, and we'll circulate, we'll uh, ask Alicia and others to circulate the link, but it's contact at um, rare dementia support or one word lowercase dot org is the contact email for the team. Okay, so I should, I think at that point, probably um, get off. Um, but I'll hand over to um, Anna to go through practical tips. So Anna, I think the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. So hello and welcome everybody. And um, for those of you who do not know me, Hi, my name is I Anna Volkman. Um, we're about to start a video uh, that I've prepared earlier where I'll be talking about practical tips. Thank you. I'm a senior speech and language therapist at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and I'm one of the team members running the PPA support group. 
And we thought today it would be really helpful to share some practical tips for managing your communication during lockdown. And these are tips that we've collated from people living with primary progressive aphasia and their families. So the first thing that people have shared is the fact that actually having a really good routine supports them in their communication, in their conversation and their interactions. And actually having a routine can be quite tricky. So sharing the routine with a loved one with PPA can be really difficult because actually accessing a calendar with lots of written information on it can be really, really hard. So one of the things that people have aimed to do and, and that I've actually supported many people to do is make their routine accessible. So some people have bought whiteboards and uh, use whiteboards um, to write on or pin pictures on or photos on. Other people have printed a piece of white paper and or we've sent them a laminated piece of paper with this routine on it. And then they've used it to stick pictures or use keywords of people in your actual lives. So for example, I was working with somebody recently and they were saying that in the past, at the beginning of every week, um, they put all the things on the calendar and they'd individually check the calendar so they knew what was going on. But what they were doing now is actually sitting down together at the beginning of every week and um, using photos of the people in their families and sticking them onto a, um, a, a chart like this just so that their, their wife, the wife who had primary progressive aphasia could actually know exactly who was coming and exactly what activities that they were going to do with pictures of the activities from their own home. And they plan that in advance and they'd incorporate into that routine daily activities that you might not normally include on a um, on a calendar so they were incorporating things like activities they do around the home together leisure activities like dominoes or even things like physical activity and seeing family and i'm going to talk about each of those in turn now starting with um, routine daily activities and one of the things uh, people have said to me is that doing routine daily activities together and considering them an activity that they collaborate on has been something that's really helped them uh, communicate and be together. And often I talk to people about the fact that conversation isn't actually always verbal. Conversation is also something we do non-verbally where, for example, one person may be washing up and the other person may be drying up. And as one person washes one item, they pass it to the person who's drying up, who dries it. And there's some non-verbal communication and interaction that becomes part of being together. So what people have talked about is really um, focusing on things that aren't just about, you know, discussing the the philosophy and politics and at the moment lots of people aren't so keen on discussing those but actually being together and doing things together that's also a type of conversation and I just wanted to share a picture of this this is a picture of somebody polishing furniture and there's been some lovely research that's been actually published in Guardian recently where they talked about the importance of doing these types of activities um, uh, to give a person meaning and purpose and, and pleasure in daily routine. The other thing people have talked about is physical activities. And so one couple I was talking to, they, they were explaining that they've been going on a daily walk together. And on that walk, they would hold hands. And often the person with a primary progressive aphasia would communicate to her husband by indicating which route they should take. So it's like gently nudging her husband down the path she wanted to go to. And he talked about that as being part of their conversation and their experience of being together. He also talked about um, going to a park that they felt safe in and going at a time of day where they where there weren't too many people, but actually that, that act of going out being really important. The other thing somebody shared with me recently was that they bought a table tennis um, table and popped it up in the garage and they talked about this table tennis. So tennis being a almost like a conversation where they each took turns. One person took a turn, the next person took a turn and that this could really um, take up 
hours and hours of their day, but actually that their loved one was really good at it. And she felt this, this interaction really revealed his competence in a conversation. And other people have shared ideas like doing yoga online jointly, just by Googling these things through YouTube, for example. Another thing I've talked quite a bit about not communicating actually, and something that people often speak about is the value of quiet time. And somebody recently described um, being quietly with her partner as being in a safe space. And this, I thought this really beautifully summarized what many, many people have said to me over the years is that actually being together while doing something that doesn't require speech and language, but being together whilst coloring, watching television, or jointly solving a puzzle, which again, you know, doesn't require language. You can put forward a piece or put forward another piece without actually having to talk about it, or even listening to music or playing music to get together that might be something that people enjoy doing these are things that you can do together that act where the emphasis is not on the talk but it's on the uh, the quiet activity that you're undertaking however people have really emphasized that it's been important for them to keep in touch with others and this is not only the person with ppa themselves but also their their loved ones that they're living with and i think one of the things that people talk about here is that it, it doesn't have to be all tech, it can also be a phone call. And when they were doing that phone call, they didn't only um, do that on the telephone with one individual. People often shared that they'd put the call on speakerphone so that even if their loved one with PPA couldn't actually talk to that call, they'd be part of it and could hear the, the exchange that was happening. What people have shared with us, however, is that they have tried out technology and they've urged us to share this with others. So people who would never ever normally explore technology um, are trying out video calls, they're trying out platforms like Zoom, or they've tried out things like WhatsApp, um, they've tried out things like FaceTime, and they've all unanimously reported back that trying this technology out has had really positive consequences um, in terms of keeping in touch with family members, but also in terms of the communication needs of their loved ones. So video calls have the power of allowing you to see the non-verbal communication of the other person and actually really increase the group nature of a conversation. So people talked about doing group Zooms with family members, attending a Friday night quiz every week. And even if their loved one with PPA couldn't participate in the entire quiz, that loved one was often able to be present. And if they became fatigued, they could withdraw from the conversation and then re-enter it appropriately at a later time. And in my clinical work, what I found is actually that often trying it out and can result in a success very easily and very quickly. And if it doesn't result in success, there's lots of people available who can help. I've often found that people with primary progressive aphasia um, can use their resources that are not language based. So facial expression, tone of voice, pointing, gesture, jointly having uh, uh, explaining something with their loved ones. People are often able to bring a photo from another room or bring an object from another room to show on a video call and equally see that in others. So they're able to if perhaps their auditory processing is not so good, they can see what's being said, they can see the lip movements, they can see the, the, the other person's gestures. The other thing, so just a couple more points to make here, is that people have shared with us it's been really important um, to alert other people to their communication difficulties during the current COVID pandemic. So we've spent lots of time making things like this, so almost, almost like wallet cards or laminated communication cards, explaining the needs of the person with a PPA so that when they're going to their local shops or when they meet somebody, they're able to um, provide the information um, on, a, on a written card. For example, the other thing um, we've often also um, supported people to do is, is go to their local shops and talk to their local shopkeepers so that those people understand that maybe that person isn't able to wear a mask. One of the key things that people have said throughout, however, is the importance of talking about all of this, of sharing their experiences, sharing tips and hints. Um, the Rare Dementia Support runs lots of support group meetings, so we have three like today throughout the year, but we've also got lots of smaller group meetings and um, 
connecting people with with other people um, is is really valuable and i can share also from my clinical experience that lots of people i've worked with even if they're their music groups or their activity groups have ceased there's been some um opportunities to participate in things online so for example um online communication cafes online music groups online choirs that people have still been able to um, participate in and feel really rewarded by so just finally if you're having difficulty with communication or just more broadly during lockdown then please do get in touch and ask us for help we've developed the, an emergency toolkit and and we can help you brainstorm any difficulties you're having on a regular basis thank you very much Thank you very much, Anna. That is fantastic. And um, just to reassure everybody, we do understand the nightmare of masks. Uh, uh, you know, it's like the worst possible thing in some ways for people with communication problems. So as I say, please do tell us about it, hopefully via Chris and Anna's survey. Um, we want to hear what's been going on with the mask problem. And the music group plug, I can certainly give a plug for the importance of music and there's an enormous amount of online music going on actually a lot of musicians have really stepped up um if people are, are into music that's a big source of comfort for people can be um but the the thing i was most amazed by anna's talk is where she found a picture of a dial telephone i thought they didn't exist anymore outside of museums anna amazing uh, blast of the past um i need to hand over now to martin cooper um now martin hope you're, you're ready there. Um, this is um, getting his experiences really of living with PPA um, and in particular in the COVID uh, era. So, Good morning everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning with one of our valued members, Martin Cooper, um, who has come to share some of experience of the past year, which has been very difficult for all of you. So good morning, Martin. Good morning, all. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So Martin, can you tell everybody watching today about your slightly complex diagnosis? Right, I am 72 uh, and have been diagnosed with the PSP and PPA. That is, I have a progressive supranuclear palsy, which affects my balance. I constantly feeling, feel, I'm losing my balance and I've fallen seven times over the last two years. It also affects my swallowing and I get a coughing fit whenever I eat or drink. PSP affects my eyes, so I can't always open my eyelids and I'm forced to close my eyes when a bright a light shines, including the sun. I cannot concentrate on more, more than one thing at a time. And brachykinesia, which is slowness of movement, means that I am progressively more clumsy. The subset of PPA that I have is progressive non-fluent aphasia, 
which means it takes a lot of effort to speak. I hope you appreciate this. And my command over grammar and spelling once faultless in the dim distant past is degenerating. It takes me hours to write a short mail email and I have to read it over carefully and use spell checker every few words because I miss entire words and letters out which is a big change because I read for a degree in classics and I retired at 66 having spent the previous 40 years in IT and the last 20 years as a technical salesman for a global IT supplier where I was responsible for putting together multi-million pound IT solutions and addressing meetings uh, between six and six hundred in a technical and persuasive manner you can imagine the experts I had to come up against I first saw my GP in 2017 because I had difficulty pronouncing sibilance. For example, the word strategy, I can say that word now but struggle with the word neurology as well. Unfortunately, you will listen to me stumble over that word several times today. The local neurologist diagnosed me with age-related vascular dementia but referred me to the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford which is a teaching hospital of Oxford University this was the first in three diagnoses, each of which got worse. I maybe shouldn't have looked into it too deeply. The neurologists at the John Radcliffe Hospital could find nothing wrong but my GP didn't believe them and she suggested that I get a second opinion. I, in my ignorance I opted for a neighbouring 
NHS Trust. Firstly, I was seen by a member of the neurology team who decided to exclude other possible causes for various symptoms and ordered a second MRI and an EMG. The neurologist also ordered me a battery of nerve conduction tests. After this testing regime, the neurologist put forward a possible diagnosis of logopenic PPA. But she referred me to a senior neurology consultant on her own team, which is where UCL come in. He studied at UCL and had first time first hand experience of PSP. Having to diagnose his father in law, which must have been a brave thing to do. He sent me to Queen Square for more neuropsychometric testing and he consulted with a colleague who assured me that my eye movements were not normal. He apologized for diagnosing PNFA together with PSP. This was late in 2019. So it was it was quite a long drawn out affair. Yes. So we've we've been in sort of lockdown or certainly severe restrictions um, for the last year nearly now. It's coming up to a year. So how have you coped? over the last year, Martin? Very well, actually, because at the start of the year, in, I was referred, uh, my GP's request to the local community neurological rehabilitation service at the end of 2019 they put on a series of PPA group meetings followed by video calls when the first lockdown hit, I got to know their physiotherapists and occupational therapists. And they looked after me very well. 
supplying me with an exercise plan, a relator and grab rails. We had a good summer and um, I can still drink beer or beer with thickener in it and do a, a jigsaw and mow the lawn and sit in the garden chair in the sun when I'm done. Focus on what you can still do as opposed to dwindling on what you give up. Lockdown is a nuisance as I speak very slowly, but the slurring gets worse as I get more tired and I speak at a volume which is bad in so social situation and is even more problematic when I'm wearing a face mask. It's okay in video conferencing because the microphone boosts the volume for me. The quarterly Red Dementia support meetings were all switched to online and various conversation groups were offered online out of which the voice of identity and power VIP group has evolved of people living with a variety of dimensions and I am a grateful member of that group. I have enjoyed the conversations immensely and found them cheerful in the extreme. I soon found that I improved with the practice of speaking and speaking does not tire me as much as he used to. The participants of this group help each other by sharing solutions and cheer each other up by sharing funny stories. This is vital, I think, to the mental health of the participants. I believe online support groups and the VIP group in particular provide the means of practical practicing speaking which I'm not doing very well now. You're doing fantastically. I have participated as many video calls as I can. I am in, involved in nine altogether. 
I have a virtual beer with my drinking body and holiday body and cruising body suggested by him and organized by me which reminds me of the benefit of PSP you didn't think all the symptoms were bad did you I have two symptoms which are beneficial. The one symptom is apathy, which makes me unconcerned about my imminent demise. And the second one, which is prompted by the virtual beer, is that you don't get any hangovers anymore. I've participated in as many support groups as I can find. But having sampled a variety, I can say without question that the groups facilitated by RDS are the most beneficial and the facilitators must take credit for it including Nikki. Martin, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for your kind words. You make me blush now, but it is just amazing to hear how busy you've been, how proactive you've been, and how empowered you've been. You're an absolute total inspiration. Um, quick word before you go, how's Mrs. Cooper doing with you in lockdown? Well, the misunderstandings are getting worse as my cognition deteriorates. I, I've discovered another word that I cannot pronounce. Deterioration. But it is a bit of a mouthful, it really is. I'm sure she's looking after you very well. So thank you so much for sharing your experience today. If you have any questions for Martin, please send them in now and we will filter them through and they will be available to answer these on the panel Q&A shortly. Thank you so much, Martin. Okay. So thank you, thank you to both of you and thank you to Nikki for facilitating and Martin, um, particularly big thanks to you for doing that. Um, and uh, I, I like the point about the virtual beer, but I really like also the point about the importance of um, contact uh, and, and sounds a bit strange in this era, but really important to people to know that there are other people out there. And actually all of you, of course, are the main um, reason that that is so useful more useful than medicines at least at the moment in ppa i would argue so now um to crack on and hand over to um the next speakers the, the two bright young things uh who are um mike carmen and jess um who are phd students um uh, currently working uh, on different aspects of ppa uh, and related dementias and they will talk particularly i think about um the challenges and what they've done to adapt their work to um, the COVID era, which I think is very important for people to realise that there is actually still research going on. It does require some ingenuity though. 
to get it all going remotely. So um, I'll hand over to Mike Carmen and Jess. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm Mike Carmen. And I'm Jess. We're both PhD researchers from the Dementia Research Centre at Queen Square. Uh, so we'd first like to thank RDS for giving us the opportunity to join today's webinar. Uh, RDS has truly been amazing at creating a sense of community, um, especially during these strange times. Um, and as we provide an update on research, we would really like to highlight that the RDS is also conducting their own um, and that you can participate in, uh, such as a survey that was attached in your recent PPA support letter. Uh, but for today, we're just going to focus on research being conducted through our lab at the Dementia Research Centre um, because we've been able to transfer our face to face research to online and we hope that with this new virtual start in research again, we can continue our research efforts as before, but also to build a smooth transition back to face to face research when the world returns to some form of normality again. Um, so first, it's really important to address the big question of why are we doing this research? Um, and as you know, and most certainly more than us, given your firsthand experience, either as someone living with a diagnosis of PPA or as someone who knows of someone else who has a diagnosis of PPA, that the difficulties faced within PPA can cause a lot of distress when interacting with other people and when performing certain activities of daily living. Um, these difficulties can include problems with hearing um, as well as uh, perception of time. So my Carmen and I are particularly interested in hearing and time perception because we know from your personal accounts that these functions are impacted and they directly affect your life on a daily basis. Um, so now at present, we still do not fully understand why particular forms of PPA manifest with such symptoms and also why individuals with the same PPA diagnosis may be differently affected by the disease. So by investigating how our brain processes different types of information, such as complex sounds or time, we're hoping to uncover how different forms of PPA disrupts brain functioning. So therefore, in the long run and very much through your contributions to research, we're just hoping to be able to develop new, accurate and efficient tools to aid in future diagnoses. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has been hugely disrupted for many, perhaps even more so um, for people living with dementia and to their families. Uh, we can only begin to imagine how the precautions in place and the different measures of social distancing during the various lockdowns slash opening phases have made things harder for you. Um, so as we mentioned prior, we're very much in awe of the RDS and their initiatives as they have been able to keep the sense of community and support that is so important to all of you and to us. Uh, but now that we are in uh, some sense more familiar with the virus and perhaps better at coping in these unique situations, we thought it was also important to try and find ways to keep research going as well. Um, so hence today's update. So we'll start by clearing up some aspects on setting up the new remote uh, research visits, um, which can actually is really similar to face to face research. We know that many of you watching have generously helped with our face to face research in the past, so you may find this quite familiar. So we'll start by either contacting you to ask if you're interested or you may contact us to let us know you're interested. As you saw in the advert we sent in the newsletter as well. As so from there, we'll then find a time to work out whether the research can then be conducted. Um, what is different is that we will be doing this remotely, so we'll contact you via phone to ask some initial questions and then we would also use a video conferencing software such as Zoom, uh, Teams, GoToMeetings or any other platform that you feel comfortable using. Um, so we would made sure that everything we do is as user friendly as possible and I've tried to reduce any unnecessary technological complications just to make sure that the experience is as pleasant as possible for everyone. Um, however, because of this, unlike in face to face testing, we will have some form of a technology eligibility criterion. Um, mainly, we just want to ensure that your Internet connection and environment in your homes are suitable for remote testing. So here is how a remote research visit will look like. So everything will be home based. We'll ask you to find some quiet space where you'll be the least distracted. And all you'd basically need is a computer or a tablet, a webcam and some headphones if you own some because we use sounds for many of our experiments. Now, one thing that makes remote testing quite attractive is that the schedule will be much more flexible. 
So those of you who have already contributed to our research over at Queen Square will know that the face-to-face -face research visit typically consisted of two and even three jam-packed days of testing sessions, as you can see on this slide. By the way, we cannot emphasize enough how grateful we are about your previous contribution, so massive thank you. Um, but now that you will be able to do everything from home, we plan the research visit in a much more flexible way. So here is an example uh, of, a, of the schedule of a remote research visit. So first of all, we divided the research visit in multiple sessions. So one session is essentially one task. Then we spread those sessions over any three days within a week, so they don't have to be consecutive, as you can see. And we made sure that each individual session does not last longer than an hour. So we really wanted, want to make it work nicely with your normal schedule. And same as in face-to-face -face testing, we'll go through some standard psychology and language tasks, with the difference being that we'll do this over a video conferencing software, such as Zoom. However, because we are remote, there will be no brain scanning of any type, so no MRI scan nor MEG scan. Finally, we have designed some new tasks looking at hearing, music, and time perception, and those will be conducted through a new online experiment platform called LabVanced, and we actually wanted to show you today uh, how it works. So Jess is going to click on the link uh, that will direct her dir um, directly to uh, the experiment. Um, so a new window has been opened and she can do everything from there, just following the instructions on the screen. Uh, but one cool thing that we can do remotely is, to, is that I can take control of her screen uh, like this. So I'm just going to request control. Jess will allow me and now you can see that I'm moving my mouse on her screen and I can press start for her and start the experiment. So this is great because it allows us to perform experiments even if people do not feel particularly comfortable with technology because then we can do all the clicking for them. And importantly, Jess still controls her screen so she can still move her mouse, she can still do the clicking. So basically we can be flexible. I'm just going to stop the demonstration now. So uh, one other important thing that I uh, wanted to go over is the carers involvement. So first of all, a huge thank you to all the carers, friends and family members. Research would not be possible without your help. So really thank you. Your involvement for remote testing will be similar to when we did face to face research, but with a few changes. So first, even with all the precautions and pretext screening that we'll do, we ask that someone stays in the same room and or within earshot of the participant with PPA doing the research visit. This is just to ensure that someone can assist them in case any technological problems arise. And as we know, in this modern age of technology, glitches can unfortunately arise even when we're being careful. This is especially important if the participant is using a tablet. In that case, we would ask you to stay closer to them. Because of this, we will ask you to make sure that the schedule we set up will be compatible for both you as the carer and the participant with PPA. Obviously, carers will not be allowed to help the participants in answering questions or doing tasks, even though we understand it may be tempting at times. And however, if you're also keen on joining in the research separately, we would love to hear from you as well. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to contact us at our emails here to let us know. Uh, but also, if you have any further questions, we'll try to respond as soon as possible. Likewise, we'll be present during the Q&A session later. So if you already have any questions, please do ask them then. We look forward to hearing from you all soon. And lastly, we would like to emphasize that none of our past research, as well as our hopes of continuing the research, would be remotely possible without all of you. You all play a crucial role in our research efforts, and we want to thank you immensely for this. Thank you. OK, so a uh, big thanks. Um, and now we'll bring everyone up now for the Q&A, but I did just want to say that it is an incredible amount of work that went into the um, adaptation for COVID. And Mike, Carmen and Jess and Chris are behind the scenes have shown a, a, a lot of ingenuity to get everything up and running. And I remember the other end of the pandemic when I first came back to the UK having been away for a bit in Australia I came back into the into it I just didn't know what we would do 
So they, they have done an amazing job getting it all up and running. Okay, so I'll hand over the chair to Anna for the Q&A, um, who I ho hopefully we'll see how it goes. We'll, we'll keep everything running seamlessly from here in. Anna. Thank you very much, Jason. So we've had a number of questions from everybody. Thank you very much. Please do continue sending in your questions. And um, what we're going to do is I'll read out the questions and I will put them to one of the members of our panel, Professor Warren, Nikki Zimmerman, Mike Carmen, or Martin. And there may be some questions. I'm already seeing some of the questions coming in. I'm already conscious there might be some that I will address as well. So what I thought I'd start with is the very first question that we received, um, perhaps for Nikki actually, and maybe Martin as well. Um, somebody has asked, could we give some tips on getting dressed as her husband had some problems with dexterity? You. Nikki's going to pop her volume on. Thank you. I think I was trying to unmute myself and Alicia was trying to unmute me at the same time or trying to shut me up one or the other. <laughs> so, yeah, we often get asked these questions about getting dressed. And in our group that I run with Martin and the VIP group, we often talk about um, dressing mishaps. Um, so the sort of strategies that people always say is to do it very slowly to lie things out on the bed to see what you're actually going to wear and to make sure that it's easy fitting clothes. Um, sitting on a bed or a chair to actually get your clothes on to help somebody with their clothes, making sure there's not too fiddly butters, lots of poppers, lots of zips and things so as easy to wear clothes as possible. And if there are buttons, make sure that they're nice and big easier to use or even replace them with velcro um so everything not fiddly as possible at least fiddliness uh, is what we can do big open necks or shirts with um large button zips or having some help to do that and martin what would you suggest helps you with your clothes i would say the my wife used to do the top bottom of the pillow shirts to put them on the hangers. And I've trained her to allow that bottom to be unfastened. But I would agree with you. The socks and shoes are the worst, and uh, falling over when what putting my trousers on. So I agree with you that sitting on a chair is mandatory, and take your time there's no rush it takes me an hour to get dressed in the morning but that's a scale that you should refer to in other words if it takes you less than an hour you're doing well thank but, you Matt. sorry i've finished actually anna thank you very much martin that's super helpful the second i'm going to collapse two questions into one now um, somebody has asked, two people have asked a little bit about swallowing and eating and drinking. And um, I, I just wanted to flag that some people may have difficulties with eating and drinking and swallowing, um, but some people may not. 
and things to look out for which was part of the question can be difficulties in chewing um, eating taking longer coughing when you're eating and drinking martin actually flagged a few of these in in his talk with nikki very helpfully thank you so if you're coughing when you're eating and drinking that might be a sign that you're struggling to manage food and drink and there are lots of useful aids that we can recommend. So a speech and language therapist's role is to actually assess somebody's eating and drinking and swallowing. And they're the people who would recommend strategies such as Martin Flag, which was having, for some people, occasionally we recommend having something called thickener in their drinks. For other people, we recommend very different things. And for some people, we may also link them in with an occupational therapist um, who can sometimes give some tips and hints on a modified cutlery that you can buy. You can buy, um, sometimes people just choose to start themselves eating out of a rimmed plate or a bowl, because that can be easier to scoop things out of. And some people find that they find a mug easier to hold than a glass or a cup. So actually these things need to be tailored to the individual's needs. Um, so my, my main recommendation would be to get an assessment if there was, there was some issues that you were um, around eating and drinking that were difficult for you. I'm going to move on to another question, um, probably for Jason here actually, Professor Warren. And um, this question is about whether, so the question is, as Alzheimer's disease has significantly more funding than rare dementias, does it seem likely that treatments for PPA will be dependent on Alzheimer's research findings? In turn, does Alzheimer's oriented, orientated research into tau protein entanglement, as opposed to beta amyloid, offer prospects of hope? So it's a, a long, multi-part question, Professor Warren. That's 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 fine. Thanks. And uh, yes, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so uh, I think it depends what what you mean by treatment. So I think it's quite likely that the the, the huge Alzheimer um, research effort will um, help with, for example, some of the symptomatic interventions and kind of design generally of trials, because that, you know, a lot of the principles of designing a trial for a neurodegenerative disease are similar. Um, and so kind of working out you know, sort of how you put people in, how you measure things to some extent, what kind of numbers you need, et cetera, et cetera, organisational things, all of that will benefit, I think. And I think that some of the kind of symptomatic interventions will cut across because, you know, people living with Alzheimer's struggle with some of the same things that people with, with PPA do. But um, I think it's very important and we, we try our best to flag this up and we continue to do it with funders, with Big Pharma, that there are very unique challenges posed by the diseases in their frontotemporal dementia spectrum, including PPA. And of course, not forgetting that one of the, the, the major variants of PPA is an Alzheimer variant. So logopenic aphasia, of course, sits at this very interesting interface between the two. And of, quite, of course, we hope that if we've got a disease modifying treatment, in other words, like a, a, a protein buster or something that would actually address the, the actual pathological process in the brain, that that would help people with logopenic aphasia. But there are lots of kind of caveats on that at the moment, um, because we just don't understand really enough about why it is that some people with Alzheimer's get typical Alzheimer's and others get logopenic aphasia, which is a big question in its own right. But just thinking about it very generally from first principles, we need to be addressing, as your question implies, the pathological process and the protein and the proteins are different. So even though tau, yeah, of course, it tau cuts across and we read about tau as being a big and important protein in Alzheimer's, the details of how that actually produces damage in the brain are almost certainly different. And of course, another really complex aspect of that question, which is really in the second part of the question, is that um, the, the, a lot of the Alzheimer's research effort is amyloid related. And of course, that's a huge controversial topic. And some people in the field of Alzheimer's have argued that actually a lot of the research in Alzheimer's might even be misdirected because it could be that it turns out that tau is the business end of the process. And that's a little bit heretical because the dominant idea in Alzheimer's research is still that amyloid is really the thing to be targeting. But that's 
partly traditional and conventional and because that was the first um, paradigm of the disease that people came up with and, and also of course the genetic results and other results really endorse that idea about the disease and also partly because tau might be even harder to address. I mean amyloid is hard to address and, and, and the failure of the trials indicates that to some extent but um, you know tau is even in some ways even more complicated to address. So I think it's a, it's a big and important question and the answer is to some extent it, it will benefit from Alzheimer's research and unquestionably Alzheimer's research we hope will help to drive awareness of dementia more generally and motivate um, funders and pharma to look at the other diseases but there's no I don't think there's any realistic prospect that somehow one size will fit all and Alzheimer's cures will somehow cure PPA unfortunately with the possible important exception of logopenic we, we would hope if that's okay thank you professor warren that was really helpful um so moving on to a few more questions there are a number of questions about speech and language therapy and communication and two people have asked about whether speech and language therapists offer um support to people with pnfa and psp um, within the NHS and um, my first uh, answer would be yes though it can be very tricky and it can be very um, difficult to find the right speech therapist so some localities so some local therapists may be able to offer speech therapy and some local therapists may not be able to because of the local structure and commissioning um, but we here at the National Hospital so I have the privilege of working at, at the hospital with Professor Warren and we do provide speech and language therapy to people with PNFA and um, as part of our NHS service. Locally, um, you might find that people with PSP and PNFA may find it easier to access speech therapy when it's to do with swallowing. But when it's to do with communication, that might be the the more difficult bit and another part of what Nikki and I do is we can help people navigate to find the local speech therapist and I um within these questions about speech and language therapy there's a question about um groups and um it the, there's two parts to this question some people have asked are there any conversation groups and another person has asked are there any strategies or suggestions to help with conversation between couples so i would say in both those examples speech and language therapists do often run groups and do often do individual therapy working on conversation and if you are looking for that kind of support um, go to your GP and ask them to refer you to your local speech therapist or um, please do contact us here at the at Rare Dementia Support and we can help you find your, your local speech therapist. But speech therapists will often give you guidance on not only on verbal strategies but on non-verbal strategies. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about groups and then I'm going to ask Martin maybe about the groups that he's attended but I'm going to just mention that there are some groups in the community that aren't provided by speech therapists in the NHS for example there's a, um, a charity called Discover who provide um, communication groups and they do a lot of speech therapy within their communication groups and they're also for couples and they've also made some video recordings on how to cope with communication during the times of COVID. Um, so that's a really wonderful additional resource. But um, I wondered, Martin, would you like to talk about the different groups? Who, which, where were the groups that you were attending? I attended the groups sponsored by the NHS, the Community Neuro Rehabilitation Service in Box is particularly good 
because they have a specialist in AAC and the speech and language therapist dealing with me is also a member of the helpline for PSPA. That's but, really helpful. Yeah, carry on. But um, the NHS budget only lasted so long and I took over the facilitation of the meetings when the NHS couldn't conduct them anymore but now they're revitalized for a, a number of weeks but I will take over again when they finish and it should it's important to say that these groups are all running online the groups that are run in the NHS that I run that many of my colleagues speech and language therapists run that discover the charity run the PSP groups the groups that Martin is describing, they are online. Um, and I'm really glad you mentioned, Martin, that sometimes you're, you've been taking over the running of groups, because often that's something that we find really helpful, because if we can, um, as, as a health professional, we may set up groups, help people come together, and then we may help people going forward, um, maintain their connections independently. Now I'm going to move on to another question for Mike, Carmen and Jess. And this is a question from one of our um, attendees who's, who talked about his wife having a diagnosis of logopenic variant PPA, who would love to take part in research, but her illness has progressed to the point that verbal communication is almost impossible. Would that preclude her from participating in research? Well, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I think we would need to know more about uh, that specific person and see how we could possibly adapt um, the research around her. Um, I think, yes, maybe some, not, not all of the things will be difficult, but as long as understanding uh, and speech comprehension is uh, still there, uh, I think there are still things that we can do together. Um, and But perhaps if uh, they would like to participate in research, I think uh, the husband will have to help a lot uh, on, on the actual research days. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I would have to say at the moment. Uh, but I, I'd love to talk to them directly uh, and see what we could do together. Jess, did you all, or Professor Warren, would you like to add something? Uh, Jess, do you want to go first? You're, uh... You're on mute, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps Professor Warren can go first and then Jess can. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, Jess. Um, just to say, yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's very important though, just for everybody listening, that it, it depends what type of PPA you have as to kind of where you are with your kind of speech output. And um, if, for example, for example, some people with non-fluent type of PPA lose speech output, unfortunately, quite quickly, even when a lot of other aspects of language function might be pretty good. And, and of course, that's a very different situation, literally just being cut off from your speech from somebody who's losing speech output because their overall illness is getting much more severe. And unfortunately, it does, as um, Mike Carmen said, depend. But I wouldn't want people to generalise listening to this necessarily to their own case because people lose speech output for different reasons in different types of PPA. And it's certainly true, absolutely, 
that it's often possible to find things, not always, but often possible to find things that they can do around that. But it, it, it's it, with research, but it's very important, as Mike Carmen says, that understanding is there because that ultimately is sometimes even more important than, than being able to talk. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not sure if my audio, can you still hear me? Oh, perfect. Great. Oh, amazing. Um, no, I didn't have much more to add. I was just saying that I completely agree with my Carmen, but most importantly, we can adapt any of our research um, to fit. Um, if you're interested, because I'm sure there's always a part that um, that can be done um, for herself as well. So we'll, we're really happy just to work around it and then just, yeah. So if you're very interested, please contact us. And if you're ever concerned, then we can work about what actually we'll be able to do and vice versa as well. Thank you, Jess and Professor Warren. And um, there's another question here, probably for Professor Warren. And um, it's about time. Um, so is the understanding of time affected in PPA and are there any ways to work around it? Is it more helpful to continue to try and use it or is it better for the person with PPA that things are arranged without focusing on numbers or times, for example, using an egg timer? Well, fortunately, we have an expert on time perception on the call. So I'm going to hand over to Mike Carmen first uh, and see, see, and then I'll, I'll, I'll chip in if necessary. Uh, I, uh, I thought I was on mute. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, it is indeed my PhD topic. Um, so, well, uh, Jason, I think, is the true expert there, uh, but. Um, Basically, uh, he noticed, uh, you know, while talking to a lot of different patients, PPA patients, that um, certain uh, PPA patients would develop uh, um, an altered perception of time. Uh, so people would uh, become obsessed about time in a way. So they would uh, perhaps be very rigid about specific timing. So say if they had an, a specific appointment at 2 p.m., then, you know, they would be like at 1.59 at the door waiting uh, to enter the meeting room. Um, or they would also ask for the time very often. So what we defined as uh, clock watching. Uh, so these are the kinds of uh, behaviors that uh, we have seen uh, in the clinics and that people have reported back to us as well. Um, and but at the moment um, we do not know enough uh, about uh, this um, these symptoms uh, these types of behaviors uh, so the my phd topic is really to um, understand uh, what kind of behaviors people develop and what is going on in the brain uh, that uh, triggers these behaviors um, so I'm afraid I cannot say too much more about uh, this, um, but I don't know if Jason, you would like to add anything. Okay, so my comment being very uh, cautious as a scientist, which is appropriate, but, but neurologists like to fire from the hip. So, so I would say, um, no, we don't understand it properly, but it, it's, um, we're gathering a lot of information now, and actually, Mike Carmen has a paper um, which we can circulate to you. It's all open access, like all of, hopefully all of our research is, um, if anyone's interested, which talks about time perception in the different um, different types of dementia, including the PPAs. And actually, it depends what type of PPA you have. Um, and we'll be seeing people with a whole, as Mike Carmen says, a whole range of different um, aspects of disordered time perception, ranging from um, becoming very, very, you know, um, almost obsessed with punctuality and really, really minding it a lot. And at the other extreme, um, and that, that that might be more common, and perhaps my impression is in people with semantic dementia or semantic variant, PPA, but also um, people who get very um, disordered time in terms of understanding when events in the past might have happened in relation to one another or when events are going to happen in the future. And, and I've had a number of a caregiver say to us in clinic the you know see the person their their spouse you know might 
struggle to kind of have a realistic idea of when something's going to happen or how long it's going to take for that. You know, what's really reasonable to expect how long that would take to do or, and actually we, we, we don't understand time perception very well, even in people who have, you know, healthy brains. Um, and, and there's a lot of research going on um, and, and that's sort of my comments tapping into that. Um, trying to understand, you know, it's a very peculiar thing if you think about it, that kind of we think about time rate on sort of scales ranging from sort of moment, which is kind of what we all take for granted, that I'm myself now and I was myself, you know, a second ago and I will be myself more or less in a second or two to come. But we can also think about time ranging up to the whole lifetime. I mean, we can think about things that happened when we were small children, for example, even in age. And, and all of that is kind of part of it or for see events that might be years coming along. So um, we take all that kind of for granted, but, but it whole brain effect. It isn't like um, a lot of people have said, you know, people in this area, it isn't like you can look at one part of the brain and it lights up or on a scan or if you, if you damage it and that's the end of time perception or well, that's what does time perception. Um, time perception seems to be a whole brain phenomenon so a lot of disease is affected alzheimer's does for example um but but so does ppa and actually some types of ppa might affect it really quite profoundly and that's our clinical impression so the research is sort of designed to understand as my common sense more about it what the limits of that are uh, and hopefully ideally if we can suggest strategies that would help people live with it but i think it's a bit like um sleep and kind of other rhythms, daily rhythms that we hear a lot about from caregivers, they are only now making their way into research. You know, that, that there is this sometimes big problem around those aspects of sort of living, very important for daily life, and yet they've received a lot less attention both from clinical um, doctors and also from research scientists. So, so a lot of our research is trying to kind of draw attention, spotlight some of the things that are not so obvious perhaps uh, in PPA, even things that are not necessarily primarily to do with language, but which do make a very big impact on daily life. And actually problems with understanding time is a real thing. And that's a very important aspect of those. Thank you, Professor Warren. I would also um, say the, the in the question, somebody was asking about the practical kind of um, ways of managing time and they gave an example of should we use a an egg timer um for example and i would say uh, professor warren alluded to or, or mentioned that people with semantic variant often might become more fixed on time and i found sometimes it's helpful for example when i'm giving out speech therapy exercises and um, some people with semantic variant have ended up practicing for two or three hours or more than that every day so I've, I, I've um, often used egg timers to try and limit people to suggest this is the exact amount that I want you to practice. And um, I'm sure I can see Nikki nodding. Nikki, do you have any other strategies that you suggest to people when they call the helpline to talk about time? Yeah, there's quite often a lot of obsession about time and how much time to use and being continually, if they're trying to be, especially sort of, trying to keep their independence. How do they manage things with time? And things like Google, Alexa, and matching your Alexa to your watches, to your computers. People have been extremely res resilient on doing this. And actually, um, we, we've certainly dealt with a few of our members who have um, a few sort of relationship sort of issues with, spouses nagging at them and when they don't want to be nagged up by their wives or partners or things they're much happier to listen to Alexa telling them when time's up than their wives so um we we found that was a really good um resource for people to use great thank you I'm um wondering whether Martin has any tips on time as well how do you manage your time Martin I'm uh, addicted to the diary, but I'm not 
I know about it. Yeah. I think coming back to the diary and having a routine is something else that people have talked to me about being very valuable. Yes, it's very useful. I'm using an electronic diary that's run by Google, mm. but I communicate with my wife on an analog diary in the kitchen if it's not down there then you're dead i think there's some good tips for a happy marriage there too thank you martin <laughs> and i'm right. mind <laughs> i'm mindful of time we've got a couple of minutes left there's been I, there's been a comment um, from one of the our, um, attendees today and they wanted to add to, Martin to your tips on how to manage getting dressed and they talked about slip-on trainers and slip-on trainers being very handy and also extremely cool apparently so that's a good tip for us as well fashionistas. Um, I'm just mindful that we've only got one or two minutes left um, today. There's been heaps more questions. And as usual, we will endeavour to answer all your questions over the course of the next um, short while and, and share that with you as well. Today's meeting will be available as well online. And there's been a number of people who've asked for um, references to other groups and articles in particular. And Professor Warren and, and Mike Carmen were talking about a particular article. So we will try and make those available as well. Um, I'll hand back over to Professor Warren for the last word. Um, but thank you very much for your time. Can you, you also publish Mia Carmen and Jessica's email address? Yes, yes, we, yes, we will. I, very, very. I couldn't write it down in the, the time it was displayed on the screen. Absolutely, no, we will do that. Thank you, Martin. That's very important, and I thank everybody on the panel. We're we'll very, very useful. Um, yes, don't worry. We will, we'll, we will do. We'll go away and look at some of the other questions and, and make some responses so people will be able to see that. Um, I, I just wanted to say one thing, the kind of principle of the diary, uh, very interesting to hear people's experiences. And some of this is kind of the theme here is you, if, the, if a brain, the brain is struggling to do things internally from its own, generating its own uh, like timing mechanisms, signposting, we can sometimes take some of the work away and, and kind of provide external cues. And it's the same principle in some ways, um, people with, um, Parkinson's can sometimes benefit from rhythm. You know, we give them like music or other rhythms to kind of help them to move. Uh, you, you provide the brain with the cues. So you can do that to some extent with time if, if the internal sense of time is disorganized. So, so, so sorry, just, just that it's a very important point. Um, so I will draw the meeting to a close. I hope it's been useful. I, I want to thank everybody that's participated, particularly Martin um, for, for, for sharing his experiences. Um, and Mike Harmon and Jess for, for sort of inspiration about the, how way research can continue and Anna as always very intrepidly um, providing practical advice. Nikki um, for kind of general um, coordination and behind the scenes um, Alicia who's really done a lot of the work of getting everything running smoothly um, uh, and uh, it's not her fault that things have run over, that's my fault. So um, I'll say, say goodbye to everyone for now, but we'll we'll publish the um, the information that people have asked for, and also the answers to the questions. Okay, so goodbye, everyone. Now.
Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity The National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia supports 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us, we have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Red Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you are interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out, or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.